anyone's having trouble hearing me, feel free to come closer to the front. I don't bite, I promise. I can't promise that I won't try and freeze you at some point, but uh, you know, just keep it between us. So I wanted to start a little bit by giving you some of my background, uh, where I came from. I didn't just sort of arrive into the world as a cryobiologist. I uh, actually started, like many people do, in undergrad. And I did my undergrad at Acadia University, which is right up here in Nova Scotia. And while I was there, I worked on deer flies and horse flies. And I know they're not the cuddliest creatures ever. I really like them. I think they're amazing. Uh, but uh, I can understand if you don't. That's cool. There I am in a bog um, as a much younger version of myself with one of my fly traps. Here you can see some of the diversity of deer flies and horse flies we have in Canada. I don't know if you know, we have over 45 species of deer fly and horse fly here. I think that means we're really lucky, but again, you can have your own opinions <laughs> about that if you like. And one of the species I spent quite a lot of time working on was this uh, really enormous deer fly called Merikamaya whitneyi. It's like this big, it's a huge deer fly. And on this map, I've plotted all the places where uh, this deer fly has been found. And uh, the spots right up here in Nova Scotia are the ones, places I found that fly, so I added to what we know about where that deer fly lives. And there's something that should be really obvious to you when you look at this map. A deer fly doesn't live everywhere. It only lives so far north, it only lives so far west, doesn't seem to live in the ocean. And this is something that's true for almost every organism on Earth. There's places that they can survive and places that they can't survive. And uh, really, that's a really ongoing uh, question in biology. What determines where an animal can live and where it can't live? And so what really fascinated me about this fly in the end was how far north could this species live? What determines that? And really, one of the, the best answers we have to that question is the cold tolerance of that animal determines how far north it can live. So I decided to move on from there to go to uh, the University of Western Ontario and do a PhD with Brent Sinclair. And there I studied uh, insects in the cold. And uh, two of the species that I worked with quite a lot that I think are really neat are the goldenrod gall fly, uh, Eurosta solidaginus. We're going to talk a lot more about this species later on in the talk. And this one, the woolly bear caterpillar, uh, Pyroctea isabella. This is the one, if you've ever heard the legend, that the size of the orange stripe tells you how cold that winter is going to be. That is a complete urban legend, but there are lots and lots of cool bits about the uh, biology of the species that really suggest if you've got some time, look it up. It's really neat. Now, I decided to move to, uh, to UBC to work on uh, a postdoctoral fellowship. Uh, I know that's not a term that uh, is necessarily heard that much. All a postdoc is is someone who's graduated from their PhD, but isn't a professor or working full time in a job somewhere. We're sort of an in-between stage. So when I say I'm a postdoctoral fellow, that's, that's what that means. This is one of my field sites. This is uh, Tower Beach here on the campus of UBC. And I work on some of the animals that you can't really see in this picture, but are ab absolutely carpet what we call the intertidal zone. So that's the space between the high tide line and the low tide line. Now, I, among the research that I do, um, I would call it cryobiology. I'm a cryobiologist. <coughs> As someone who studies uh, biology at low temperatures, so how do animals or organisms survive really low temperatures? How do they survive freezing? You may have heard of the term cryonics. That's the uh, study of cryopreserving uh, mammals for future revival. That is not what I do. So um, that could be maybe considered a subset of cryobiology, but just so you know, we're going to be focusing on this top question for, for today. Now, you also may have noticed I brought some friends today. You can come up and take a look at them uh, at the end of the talk. These are snails, Litterina litteria. They're not local to BC. You can find them in the wild here. These ones actually came from TNT Market, so they are here. <laughs> and uh, what I actually did this morning is I froze them. I didn't freeze them completely solid, but they were frozen for maybe about half an hour. And uh, once they were, that was done, I put them in this water. And uh, they were supposed to slowly thaw out and revive during the talk, but they've already revived and they're crawling around the aquarium. So I thought it'd be fun to see some freeze tolerant animals right here. And uh, here at UBC, I am working on marine animals, uh, including Litterina litteria. So uh, you can see some of my study friends. So today I have a series of questions that I'd like, to, like us to think about. Um, if there's any questions that come up uh, during the talk, feel free to put your hand up and I'll try and explain as best I can. Some of these ideas are a little bit counterintuitive and, and not the way we think we know the world works. So if 
If it seems like it's not making sense, just put up your hand, don't be afraid, I'm happy to answer any questions. So the first question is a really simple one. It's what animals survive freezing? And I'm going to tell you some stories about some of my favorite freeze-tolerant animals. The second is how does freezing happen? So what is freezing? How does it work? So it turns out it's a little more complicated than we thought. The third question is a question almost in physiology. How do animals survive freezing? What are some of the stressors that they experience? And finally, why is Vancouver a great place to study freeze tolerance? It's not exactly the coldest place in Canada. So I have a really good answer to that question, and I hope you find it interesting. So who survives freezing? Well, it turns out it's a trait that has evolved multiple times in the animal kingdom. There are many, many different species of animals that survive freezing. We have some vertebrates. This is the wood frog, Rhinos sylvatica. We're going to talk a, a little bit more about that species in a bit. This is a hatchling painted turtle, Chrysemys picta. And it, these guys can survive freezing solid over the winter. Other species, uh, lots of insects, so the woolly bear and the gall fly I talked about before. And almost all mollusks that, uh, that we've come across and actually tested survive freezing. So this is Litterida litteria, those, those guys there in the aquarium. These are mussels, blue mussels, Mytilus trosilus. This is a species we have right here in Vancouver, and they are very, very freeze tolerant. And one really special guy here in the middle, again, I highly recommend um, just Googling this, this uh, animal. This is a tardigrade or a water bear. I think they are so cute. But they're also really, really stress tolerant. They can handle radiation. They can handle space. They can handle uh, no water for, for years on end. They're really, really tough little organisms. And they also are freeze tolerant. So uh, they're just an incredible, incredible animal. Now. I know this is not what Vancouver looks like in the winter. This is how most of Canada looks, but, but not really the, this area of BC. But it's pretty typical. We have a lot of snow. We have a lot of dead plants. Looks like there's not a lot of interesting biology going on. But you'd be wrong. Within these plants, these are goldenrod plants that have, that have died over the winter. This is the normal part of their life cycle. And within these plants, you can see these little balls. Within each one of those little balls, is a goldenrod gall fly. And the gall fly actually induces those balls to grow on the plant. So the plant looks like this um, in the fall as it's flowering. It's just a, a really common weed, the, gold, the goldenrod plant. We see it all over Canada and North America. We even have it out here in BC. And uh, the fly does is it chews on the inside of the plant and it produces that bulb around it. And it actually feeds all summer long on nutrients that the plant itself produces. But over the winter, the gall fly just stays within the, in the ball that it's produced and it kind of hangs out in there as a home. And what that means for the gall fly is that it's not buffered um, by the snow like most insects are. So it actually experiences a full range of low temperatures that, uh, that the air temperature gets to. So here, this is the uh, air temperature in, on, in Ontario over the course of the winter. It gets pretty cold down below minus 20 degrees Celsius several times. So it's pretty normal for southern Ontario. And uh, what I've done is I've plotted on here the freezing point of this fly. And what you should be able to see is that the fly freezes and thaws several times over the course of that winter. And uh, some of my lab tests have actually shown that it can survive freezing 10 times at minus 20 degrees Celsius for 12 hours apiece. Other lab tests have shown this fly can survive uh, frozen, being frozen solid at minus 80 degrees Celsius for a day or two. It's really an incredibly freeze-tolerant animal. And it does this by producing uh, crack protective compounds. We'll talk a bit about what those might be later on. It also produces some antifreeze proteins, and I'll show you some examples of those. Now, something that I think is really cool about this fly is it actually has the, the most interesting fat cells of any animal, as far as I'm concerned. So I might be a little biased. Uh, so these fat cells, what I've done here is I've stained the nuclei with a fluorescent dye. So you can see each cell has one nucleus. And you can see the, the fat around there. Now, what's interesting about these fat cells is they actually are some of the few cells in the animal kingdom that can survive what we call intracellular freezing. So that's freezing of the actual, actual fluids in the cell itself. We don't know exactly how that happens. But uh, I did find in the last year a compound called acetylated triacylglycerols. Don't worry about the details. Um, but uh, if you want to hear more about that, uh, it was on Quirks and Quarks uh, in mid-May. So uh, check that out. But what we think they do is they allow energy consumption, potentially, 
when other fats would be solid. So at really low temperatures, um, imagine like if you have a bit of olive oil and you stick it in the fridge, it's going to solidify. Well, just like your olive oil solidifies when it's really cold, so does the fat of, uh, of in an animals like insects. So they need a really fluid fat to be able to, uh, to consume and, and maintain their metabolism over winter. Or it may have a cryoprotective function. It might be why their fat body cells can survive freezing within the cell. We're not sure, and that's uh, some of our ongoing research. Another animal you may have heard of is the mountain pine beetle. This is obviously a really important pest species here in BC. So I've plotted uh, some of the outbreak locations of the pine beetle. Um, here, you can see it produces vast amount, um, areas of, of dead trees because it's consuming those trees. And it turns out understanding the cold tolerance of this pine beetle is really important for understanding how the pine beetle populations and outbreaks might change with a change in climate. So it's a freeze avoiding species. That means it can't actually survive ice formation. But what it can do is avoid freezing all the way down to minus 40 degrees Celsius. So even though the temperatures are well below what we think of as the freezing point of water, they remain unfrozen. Now, what's really important for their survival is that the air temperature doesn't drop below minus 40 degrees. Once that happens, they freeze, they die. And so as climate warms, that really low temperature threshold that's important for them, that minus 40, happens less and less over the course of the winter. As that happens, fewer of them die over the course of the winter and more of them survive, <laughs> producing more and more uh, forests that look like this. So they're not freeze tolerant, but they still produce all the same cryoprotectants and antifreeze proteins as the gall fly that I showed you in the previous slide. Now finally, I think one that uh, might be pretty popular is this uh, frog. This is a wood frog, Rana sylvatica. And I had the opportunity to work with uh, Ken Story. He's, you can almost think of him as the granddaddy of cold tolerance research in Canada. He's done lots and lots of work on uh, freeze tolerant vertebrates. You can uh, look up his webpage, it's really neat. He's got lots of uh, cool information. But what we were really interested in was that what happens to the lungs of a frog that, uh, that freezes, thaws out, and survives? So what we did is we measured the carbon dioxide production of the frog over a freeze-thaw cycle. So the reason we measure carbon dioxide is that whenever an animal breathes, it breathes in oxygen and breathes out carbon dioxide gas. So it's a way of being able to see, see the breaths of the animal. So each time it, take, it breathes out, a little push of carbon dioxide gas comes out. So here on this, uh, this uh, graph, we have carbon dioxide gas on the y-axis. And along the x, we have time. And uh, what you can see, oh, and I should point out here where it's blue, that's where the, the uh, frog began freezing and had some ice formation in its body. So what we did is we cooled down the frog and measured its carbon dioxide production. You can see it's breathing here as it begins to freeze. At one point right here where the, the trace gets really smooth, the lungs of the frog have actually frozen. So it can't breathe. All this really smooth carbon dioxide production here, that's just coming off, um, off the skin of the frog, so it's not being breathed out. But here's a really incredible thing. We start warming it up here, ice formation ends, the lungs start thawing, 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 and all of a sudden right here, after being frozen for over 12 hours, the frog takes a deep breath and breathes out carbon dioxide again, and its lungs are st functioning again. It's really incredible, and, and I think just one of the most awesome things you can see as a scientist. Now, we still are working out the ways that this happens. Um, it's obviously really, really interesting and has been for a long time. One of the best theories going around so far is that a f the frog, like uh, most vertebrates, has a store of what's called glycogen in its liver. Now, what glycogen is, is just a carbohydrate. And the important thing about glycogen is it can release glucose. So when the frog senses freezing beginning, it releases glucose into its, uh, its blood, and all glucose is is a sugar, that's it. And that glucose actually works like a cryoprotectant in its bloodstream, and it pushes its glucose through in massive quantities through its bloodstream. Now this is really cool because this is also an analog to what it's like to be diabetic, to have this, these really high uncontrolled levels of blood sugar in the bloodstream. And, and what some of Dr. Story's work is actually focused on how do they survive this, how do they control that glucose um, content in their, in their uh, bloodstream. So I've described a little bit about some of the research, but I thought it might be even better if you could see a video of what it looks like when one of these frogs freezes. 
and when it thaws out. So uh, this is actually borrowed from the Learning Channel, but it features uh, Dr. Story as well as his wife, uh, Jan Story. So oh, now I've talked a lot about all these different species that can survive freezing. I'll point out actually that the wood frog can survive freezing, but not to very low temperatures, only to about minus 8 degrees Celsius or so. So the mountain pine beetle can survive much lower temperatures, but it can't handle ice formation itself. And so in general, we distinguish between surviving ice formation and surviving low temperatures. Those are two very different stressors for animals. So I'm going to take a real step back. We're going to think a little bit about some of the chemistry of what happens during uh, ice formation. We'll start at the real basics. So what's water? Well, water isn't chemical. It's made up of two different kinds of atoms. Those are hydrogen and oxygen. And uh, what happens with water is that it's hard to imagine, but you can see uh, animations maybe on YouTube and think a little bit about this because it's, it's a very counterintuitive idea. But even in the water in that aquarium, all the molecules of water in that aquarium are moving around like crazy. They're just vibrating and they're doing all this. Now, as they cool down, they move slower and slower. Once they get slow enough, those little hydrogen atoms and those oxygen atoms within the molecule will start attracting each other. And once they get slow enough, they'll actually form a crystal lattice. Looks just something like this. And this has really interesting properties. This works a little differently um, than almost any other molecule we know of. When it forms a solid, it actually expands. And the reason for that is that the spaces between each of the molecules is actually farther apart in this lattice form than it is in the liquid form. So that's really strange. You may have encountered this if you've you know, done something like I have and actually put a bottle of pop in the freezer and then it you know, expands as it freezes and explodes. That may or may not have happened. I, I won't admit to it, actually. <laughs> but uh, that's really weird. Another weird thing about freezing is water doesn't actually freeze at zero degrees Celsius. This is really, really strange. This goes against what we sort of think of as common experience. It only melts at zero degrees Celsius. And I'm going to show some examples of that later on and how that works and what it's called, but take my word for it for now. You can theoretically actually cool water down to minus 45, minus 44 degrees Celsius before it freezes. That's the theoretical limit of uh, what we call supercooling in water. And finally, when water solidifies, it actually releases heat. Again, that seems really counterintuitive. And the reason for that is think about those molecules moving really fast in that liquid. They have lots and lots of energy. When they slow down and form that lattice shape, what's happened is they've actually given up energy. And so we can actually detect that energy they give up as heat. And I'm going to show you some examples of that later on. But again, it's a very counterintuitive idea for sure. And uh, something you might not have known is there's actually 15 known kinds of ice. And when we say 15 different kinds of ice, what we mean are different formations of these molecules in, in a lattice shape or other kinds of shapes. We usually only, only see one kind of ice in nature, that's this uh, lattice shape. But there are some animals that take advantage of something called vitrified ice. So that's ice, instead of having a nice uh, lattice shape, it actually is amorphous. The molecules are, are arranged in kind of a disordered kind of way. And that actually can be a really important part of cold tolerance for some animals. So I'm going to show you a little example of, of some of the things I was just talking about. I know it seems a little strange. So I'm going to talk about how we detect freezing. So imagine we have a little tube of water, not that big, and we decide to cool it down. So we cool it down over time. And uh, the, what I do in my lab to be able to detect the temperature of things is I use something called a thermocouple. I brought an example here attached to a thermocouple meter. You can come check it out after uh, the talk is done. And uh, what it's got in it are two different kinds of metal. In the case of this thermocouple, it's copper and con constantin. And the two different types of metal, when they're um, in contact with each other, actually have a voltage that goes over those two metals. And as the temperature changes, that voltage changes. And we can use that to calculate what temperature it is. So we've got our little tube of water. We're cooling it down over time. And once we hit zero degrees Celsius, we pass the melting point of water. Now, to get ice to actually form, what we need to have happen are those water molecules to arrange themselves in a lattice sort of shape. And it turns out that uh, the more of those water molecules you have, the more likely it is that some of them are going to hit exactly the right conformation to form that lattice. 
So it cools, it cools, it cools. At some point, some of those molecules form that lattice that we're looking for, and they spread. As soon as a, one little, a few little molecules make a lattice, they can induce that lattice shape in molecules around them. It's really strange. And so that's where we get the freezing point. The point between the melting point and the freezing point is what we call supercooling. That's when a liquid is below its melting point, but not yet frozen. And one of the sort of few technical terms I'll, I'll throw at you today is called the supercooling point. That's the limit of when supercooling ends. So if you ever see that anywhere, all that means is it's basically the same thing as a freezing point. Now, again, this is real data, actually, from an animal that I froze. You can see that increase in temperature as it freezes, and that's the release of heat energy as those molecules go from moving around a lot to locking into that lattice shape. And so what animals can do is they can manipulate when that, that supercooling point happens. They can do that by reducing the amount of water that they have in their bodies. So the less water they have, the less likely the fewer molecules there are that could actually hit that lattice shape just right. The presence of ice nucleators or antifreeze proteins, and I'll talk a little bit more about those later, as well as solute content. So solute content, all that is is stuff dissolved in water. So if you've ever uh, tried to boil water for your pasta and you've added salt to that water, that's lowering the boiling point of the water. And animals can do the same things with their body fluids. They can uh, have a whole bunch of sugar in their bodies, and that actually reduces the freezing point and the melting point. But, uh, okay, we've talked a bit about the phys chem of what happens during freezing and, and some of the challenges maybe are for an insect at low temperatures kind of running through your mind. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this from the insect's perspective or from the animal's perspective. Now, all the animals we know that are freeze tolerant are what we call ectotherms. So ectotherms are animals whose body temperature changes along with their environmental temperature. Uh, mammals like us, or like cats, or like dogs, try and maintain an, a constant internal body temperature. They're called endotherms. And so all these freeze-tolerant ectotherms, their body temperature is going to decrease just as we're lowering the, the temperature of their environment. We've got our little lady beetle here who's going to experience some low temperatures. Now, once she gets cold enough, she's going to enter something called chill coma. Chill coma, all it means is that the animal has lost the ability to move around. It can't use its arms and legs. Uh, there's lots of actually YouTube videos on this where someone has taken a dragonfly or a bee, stuck it in the refrigerator, and it enters chill coma. It doesn't move around. They take it out, they tie a little string around it, and then they have a bee or a dragonfly on a string. You can try that. Maybe not with a bee that can sting you, but uh, uh, at least you can look at the videos. They're really neat. Now this is reversible. As soon as they warm up, they regain the use of their, their limbs. If they spend too much time at low temperatures, though, they're going to experience something called chilling injury. So this is irreversible damage to the animal. It can lead to mortality, depending on how cold tolerant the animal is. Once the animal gets cold enough, it can freeze. And uh, you can see here it's freezing. It's got that little increase in body temperature that uh, we see, depending on the size of the animal, and so how much water is converting to ice in its body, this increase in temperature can be as much as six, seven degrees Celsius. Uh, you'll, I can show you at the end of the talk uh, when those little snails froze. It was about a five degree spike in temperature, so it, it can be quite a lot of uh, heat. Oh, and there's a super cooling point. Okay, so animals respond differently depending on their cold tolerance strategy to, the, to freezing. And uh, you might have sort of gotten this hint as, as I talked through some of the species that are very cold tolerant. Most of the animals on the planet are what we call chill susceptible. So they experience chilling injury long before they ever have to worry about freezing. This includes animals like uh, the fruit flies in your kitchen, dragonflies, uh, the little shore crabs we have here in Vancouver, if you've seen those, those are all chill susceptible. So they'll enter chill coma and they'll die long before they ever have to worry about freezing. Another group of animals are what we call freeze avoiding. These are animals that can, can push down their supercooling point as far as possible and avoid freezing altogether, but if they freeze, they die. This includes animals like the emerald ash borer, which is a, a really important invasive uh, species in, in the middle of Ontario. Uh, this also includes things like the mountain pine beetle. It can push down that supercooling point as low as minus 40 degrees before it freezes. And finally, we have of course, the animals that are most near and dear to my heart, these are the freeze-tolerant animals. So things like the woolly bear or the wood frog, they can survive that freezing event, but die of freezing injury at some point after that. 
Now, you probably have been wondering, why isn't every animal freeze tolerant? How hard can it be to survive freezing? Well, what I'm going to do is walk you through what we think are the events that happen during a freezing event in an animal. So all animals are made up of cells. So we've got these all through our bodies. And outside of the cells, we have what we call the extracellular space. So that's all the liquid outside the cell. You can think of water in the cell, water outside of the cell. Now ice nucleates somewhere in the body of the animal. And once it nucleates, just like it did in the beer, it spreads through the body. Now one uh, potential um, cause of freeze damage is the nucleation of ice within the cell. That's almost always fatal. The only exception that we really know well is the, the goldenrod gallfly that I showed you and its fat cells. And uh, once ice nucleates outside the cell, it takes all those water molecules outside the cell and traps them in ice. So the cell actually leaks water into the surrounding environment. Once the cell leaks all its water into the external environment, it's going to shrink. It needs all that water in it, in it to actually keep it nice and big and plump. Now this can cause several types of damage. You can imagine the cell membrane that's around that cell can be broken or, or damaged when, when it shrinks up like that. All the machinery inside the cell that's required to keep the cell living and, and doing well, all the DNA and proteins and mitochondria and everything else you can think of in there, are all squished up against each other. They can't function the way that they're supposed to because they're just too covered and sticky, everything else that belongs in there and is supposed to be nicely spaced out. All the enzymes that might be in there, they need to be a certain shape to actually work. Enzymes are the catalyst for all the chemical reactions that go on in your body. And if they're not the right shape, they're kind of going like this, they can't catalyze those reactions and your biochemistry doesn't work anymore. Now finally, as ice crystals grow, they're sharp, they're spiky, they can cause mechanical damage to his, uh, tissues and cells in, within an animal's body. So this is another issue that uh, freeze tolerant animals have to deal with. Now it turns out that freeze tolerant animals are not passive victims of their environment, they're, they're really, really tough. They have a broad array of biochemical mechanisms to avoid all these issues. So let's go back to the beginning and uh, think about this from a freeze tolerant animal's perspective. Now the first thing they do is almost every freeze tolerant animal we know has what we call an ice nucleating agent. Ice nucleating agents can be lots of different things. They could be bacteria, they could be dirt, they could be food in the gut of an animal. They could even be proteins. So the uh, organism I've shown here, this is Pseudomonas syringae. It's a type of bacteria. And what it does, actually, it's really smart. It harnesses cryobiology to feed. So it, uh, it's often found on plants, particularly leaves. And it produces these protein ice nucleators that nucleate ice on the leaf of, of the plant and cause freezing on the leaf. The freezing damages the cells of the leaf. And then the little bacteria comes over and says, oh, hey, you've got, you're leaking out all the delicious proteins and, and sugars within you. And it just slips them right up. So its feeding strategy is, is actually uh, producing these ice nucleating proteins. It's really smart. They could, if you produce, but if you're an animal that's freeze tolerant and you want to actually nucleate ice, what you want to do is make sure that ice is nucleating somewhere um, really kind of nice, not in your most sensitive parts, maybe your toughest parts. You want it to nucleate at a relatively high temperature because the higher the temperature that ice nucleates at, the slower those freezing processes go. And the more you can control where the sugars and water in your body go. Now, uh, once ice forms at that nucleation site and spreads, what water, again, begins to leave the cell. But what freeze tolerant animals can do instead is pump their cell full of uh, cryoprotectants. So these are things like uh, polyols or sugars. So cryoprotectants you might know about would be like just standard table sugars sometimes used. Other animals use something called ethylene glycol, which is just antifreeze. They actually can produce ethylene glycol. Another one uh, is sorbitol. Sorbitol is actually used as an artificial sweetener and gum. So it, uh, we humans have taken advantage of some of these, uh, these sugars that animals produce to, to survive freezing. So what they do is they pump these sugars into the cell and keep it nice and inflated so it doesn't have that problem of all the, the machinery in the cell kind of getting glommed up and uh, stuck to each other. It also can protect the cell membrane from shrinking and that keeps it nice and uh, firm and, and functioning the way that it has to. And then finally, many animals produce what are called antifreeze proteins. So what an antifreeze protein does is it's a very special kind of protein that can actually bind directly to ice. 
So I've got them here as little Pac-Men. They don't actually look like little Pac-Men, but uh, that hopefully gives you an idea of how they work. And what they do is they keep those ice crystals nice and tiny and small so that they don't actually become large enough to cause mechanical damage. Now the confusing thing is that even really cold tolerant animals still produce a lot of these sugars and these antifreeze proteins. So these don't seem to be the key for why freeze, some animals are freeze tolerant and some aren't. And that's something that is really very much under active investigation. Now, the last topic I wanted to, to talk about was why study freeze tolerance in Canada, or sorry, in Vancouver. Canada makes sense. Canada gets really cold. The animals often survive freezing. In Vancouver, we're in the warmest, one of the warmest spots in Canada. I think Victoria is a little bit warmer. Why study freeze tolerance here? Well, there's lots and lots of animals that live in what we call the intertidal zone. So that's the zone between the high tide line and the low tide line. And the intertidal zone remains mostly ice-free through the winter, although you can get some ice. But the animals in the intertidal are actually feeding year-round. So they're always going to have potential ice nucleators within their gut. They have these nucleators around. They're going to they're have ice formation. And if they're not freeze tolerant, they're not going to survive. And also, Ice that forms in the intertidal zone, when that happens, it can act as a really excellent ice nucleator. So these animals are always, always going to be experiencing freezing threat. And then one of the animals that I have studied quite a lot is the, uh, the blue mussel, Mylos trostilus, as well as uh, my little recovered snails over there. But uh, we're going to talk a bit about the mussels for now because they stay in one place. And so there's some really interesting aspects of their biology that come up. And one of them is that they don't just live in one spot in the intertidal zone. They actually live along a broad array of, of uh, areas along the intertidal zone. And you think, well, it's just a few meters or a few feet. It's not that they don't live that far apart. But if we think of this from the perspective of the tidal cycle, here I plotted out the, the tide um, height over the course of a week in January. And the tides in Vancouver are really cool. They're what we call a mixed tide system. So we have one really low tide. Low, or sorry, one really high low tide, one really low low tide. I've also plotted on here, the, blue, the yellow is daylight, and in between it are nighttime. And so what I, I think you should be able to get from this is that these really low tides tend to happen in the middle of the night in winter here. So what that means for the animals is that they're going to be exposed to the coldest temperatures in the middle of the night. They're going to experience really the absolute worst that the air temperature hits when, if they are living in the intertidal zone. And mussels, like I said, they live along an, a range of the intertidal zone. So I plotted, here's the top of the intertidal zone and the bottom of, uh, sorry, the top of the mussel bed in the intertidal zone and the bottom. And what you should be able to see if you look here is that the ones at the top are experiencing, um, they're actually out of the water much more frequently than mussels that live in the bottom of the intertidal zone. So here they're one, two, three, four, five, six times out of water. And here there may be two or three. It's much less than for long, shorter periods of time. So I thought, well, maybe the mussels at the top of the intertidal zone are more adapted to low temperature than the ones at the bottom. And it turns out, um, oh, and I should mention I'm working with Chris Harley here at UBC. He's in the Department of Zoology. He's the one who's been talking a lot about some of the uh, sea star die-offs. So um, definitely check out some of his work if you're interested in that. But uh, here on the y-axis, I have what's called the lower lethal temperature. That's the temperature at which 50% of them die. And on the x, I have the muscles from the high intertidal and the ones from the low. And what I hope you can see is that the muscles from the high spot can survive much lower temperatures than ones from the low. And so what I'm hoping I can use this as is sort of a, a way of understanding how freeze tolerance works in muscles. Maybe because they're the same species, whatever's different between muscles from the high intertidal and the low intertidal is part of the key to understanding how their freeze tolerance works. Because what I haven't mentioned is all the stuff I, I just presented about how freeze tolerance works comes entirely from work on vertebrates and on insects. We really have no idea how marine uh, mollusks or things like mussels and snails survive freezing. And uh, they don't do any of the same things, it seems, that uh, insects and vertebrates do. So I'm hoping while I'm here at UBC to start looking a little bit at that and, and understanding a different way to be freeze tolerant. So why is freeze tolerance way cool? I think it's really cool for lots of reasons, but I'm going to talk you through a few of my favorite reasons for it being way cool. Uh, the first is the possibility for cryopreservation of, of, cryopreservation of organs. 
So there's been a lot of work in, um, we obviously have a donor sh um, organ sh shortage, so we want to get organs, if we can, to people who need them as fast as possible, because they don't last very long outside of the body. And potentially, if we could learn ways from animals that naturally survive low temperatures, we could actually preserve those organs for longer and have a greater chance of getting them to the people who need them. And there's actually just a paper published uh, about a week or so ago that was able to, uh, to extend the time by taking some lessons from some of these cold tolerant animals. Another uh, reason that I think freeze tolerance is way cool is some of the really cool biochemical products that we've gotten out of cold tolerant animals. I did mention uh, the sorbitol, which is an artificial sweetener that comes from an animal. And uh, we also have ice nucleating agents and antifreeze proteins. So um, I'm sure that many of you living in Vancouver have skied. And uh, what a lot of ski hills use is actually an ice nucleating agent that comes from that bacteria I talked about, Pseudomonas syringae. It's uh, sold in a product called Snowmax, snow inducer. So what these ski hills do is when they uh, get their, their snow machines working, they put in some of this Snowmax, and it actually causes ice to nucleate at much higher temperatures, and they're much more likely to get nicer powder that way. So this is spread all over several ski hills, and so it's sort of a useful aspect of freeze tolerance. The other is uh, antifreeze proteins. So to get a really nice, creamy um, ice cream, Often manufacturers put lots of fat or cream in their ice creams. One way, and one of the sort of interests that people have had is actually reducing the amount of fat or cream in the ice cream, and, but still keeping that nice creamy taste. The problem though is that if you get really big ice crystals in your ice cream, then your ice cream kind of tastes crunchy and crystally and, and not that smooth creamy taste. So there's actually several companies who have put in antifreeze proteins to bind to those ice crystals within the ice cream, keep them nice and small. So if you're ever curious about uh, whether or not you're eating antifreeze protein, I would totally uh, recommend looking at the ingredients list. It's called an ice structuring protein. And uh, they just come from, they come from a, a, a species of fish, I believe, that, uh, that produces the antifreeze proteins. And uh, of course, one of the last reasons, and one of the reasons I think freeze tolerance is way cool, is because it helps us understand how far north species can live. This is the uh, a range map for Rana sabbatica. It's the wood frog I was talking about. You can see it only lives so far north. So maybe by understanding what the limits of these, these, uh, these northern range limits are, we can predict maybe if we have an invasive species come into Canada, how far north it could potentially spread. Or we can understand what might happen in, with climate change. If the winter's warm, maybe a species that used to live at a particular place can move further north. And so understanding how that um, can work, really it's nice to have a good mechanistic understanding of what causes those northern range limits. Now, I have lots of people to thank, lots of uh, funding sponsors, and uh, of course my lab here at UBC, who, uh, who really seem to have uh, gotten excited about freeze tolerance and cold tolerance in the last year. And uh, I think what I'd like to do, um, I'm happy to take any questions. And I've also, these are the snails, and these are the freezing points of those snails. So if you uh, would like to ask about the snails, you can do that as well. So thank you for listening to me.